Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to one of our seminars here in CFT. Today we have the pleasure of uh, having Armin Tavakoli from Lund University. Armin did his uh, PhD in the University of Vienna in 2020, and then uh, he did uh, he started a postdoc in the Austrian Academy of Sciences uh, while he was teaching in the Vienna University of Technology. And now, since uh, 2023, January, he started to be an assistant professor in the Lund University. Uh, today, he is going to talk about entanglement in steering with imprecise measurements. So, Armin, thank you again for accepting our invitation. And the screen is yours. All right. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on your seminar. Uh, I can maybe start with saying that uh, if there are any questions at any point, just go ahead and uh, let me know and we can just uh, uh, break it off and take it immediately instead of waiting to the end but so okay so what i'm going to talk about today is entanglement and steering scenarios but when your measurements are what i call imprecise so all of this boils down to a very obvious observation which is that there is no such thing as a flawless quantum device so here, we want to try to take that seriously and see what happens to these very well-known uh, entanglement and steering scenarios once your measurements no longer are perfectly controllable. So what we want to see is what could the consequences of DB, this thing be? Do we even have to care about tiny errors? And well, what can we do about it if we do have to care? So the gist of the idea is then this. Perfect quantum devices do not exist. So what I want you to have in your mind is that you have a target device. It's this red thing, A tilde. Here, the device happens to be a measurement, but it could really be any, any sort of quantum device. So I have a measurement that I want to do, A tilde. But in real life, I cannot make A tilde perfectly. Maybe I can do it extremely well, but certainly not perfectly. In the real life, I have my lab device, this blue one, which is A, the POVM A. It is close to A tilde, but certainly not exactly A tilde. So what we want to see here is how do we deal with this fact that we can only approximate the ideal device? There are many ways of addressing that, and they have been around for quite a long time. Uh, here are three examples. One is that you can do tomography. So I can take my lab device, I can probe it with some known quantum states, I can reconstruct its entire density matrix and figure out what the device is really doing. Another option, which is completely opposite of that, is I can go device independent. So I can completely forget about trying to model the lab device. I just assume it's quantum mechanical. And then I try to deduce all my conclusions in whatever experiment I care about without having any aspiration of having a target device of any kind. And the third way, which is a bit in between these two extremes, is to try to realistically simulate possible experimental errors which is, I guess, what many experiments also do. Here, I don't want to take any of these three approaches. I want to do something that is a bit different from them all. So the other approach that I'm going to follow, again, you have a target device. In our case, we're going to focus on measurement devices that aim to be the normal von Neumann type rank one projective measurement. So a basis measurement in some Hilbert space. And we're going to have our lab devices that approximate them. In our approach, we're going to try to give a quantitative, operationally meaningful estimate of how well the lab device approximates the target device that you want to have. This we want to do against the spirit of these three previous slides. So we don't want to do tomography because it's super expensive. And also it has some other problems with precision and reconstruction, which are quite well known. We don't want to do device independence because then we give up the idea that we can control our lab at all, which is certainly not the reality. Our lab device is very close to the target device. Just because we are not perfect doesn't mean we have to give up any ambition of knowing what our devices do. We also want to avoid this to simulate realistic errors because we want to have a recipe here that works independently of your physical system. Realistic errors are realistic on a specific platform. Here we want to take a fully operational approach that you could in principle use in any experiment. So to rectify all this, the idea is to limit the fidelity between the lab devices and the target device. 
So there is a single quantity that will estimate the quality at all. You will not need to do exponentially many measurements as in tomography, for instance. That's why we focus on a simple operation and meaningful measure. You can interpret this in a, some different ways. Here are two quite natural examples of that. So if, again, A tilde is my target device and A is my lab device, I can say, well, what's the average fidelity between these two devices? I take the fidelity between these two things. Remember, I'm doing a rank one projective measurement, so the fidelity is just this overlap. Uh, that is, the target is rank one projective. The lab device can be higher rank and uh, maybe noisy and a POVM and all that. So on average, you will have some deviation from a perfect fidelity of one, which is this epsilon x. And this I call my imprecision parameter. So it's the imprecision you have when you do measurement number x. Similarly, you could say, well, I can also decide to estimate my fidelities on the level of each projection separately. So I can just look at the fidelity when I do measurement number x and get outcome a as compared to the projection I wanted to do. And then I can assign uh, other epsilons for this, other deviation parameters. The important point here is that there are some key properties that are fulfilled by making this choice. The first and most important is operationally meaningful. That means the fidelity can actually be estimated in the lab if you define it in this way. It's not some uh, uh, abstract parameter that you have to infer from some non-measurable quantity. The second thing is that it's cheap to estimate. You can do only a small number of measurements, as you see here, one per projector operator that you want to have in your target device. It's not a big overhead. The third thing is that this is tunable depending on your setup quality. If you have a setup that is really, really high quality, meaning your lab device is really close to that target device, these epsilons will be small and you will pay a small overhead because of your imperfections. On the other hand, if your quality is not so good, well, epsilons will be larger and you have to pay up a bit more once you try to do your experiments later on. It's tunable. Furthermore, as I was saying before, this is an operational approach, so it's valid for every platform. You don't need to make a new framework when you go from photons to ions to NV centers and so on. You can simply adopt fidelity as an operational quantity that can always be estimated. Something that is in the negative is the last point, which is that this is very much a worst case estimator. So the picture to have in your mind is that this thing allows you to, up to a resolution of epsilon, so a tiny deviation, allows your device to sort of conspire against you, but only on very small scales. But once you're in this little scale that epsilon permits, inside there, you could have a worst case scenario. So all the measurements could line up in the worst way possible against you. So it's not a generous estimate. It's not a Gaussian error of any kind. It's a it's an epsilon device independence approach, in a sense. The full conspiracy, but on a very small magnitude, corresponding to the er errors in your fidelity. So the scenarios that I'm going to focus on, this, these ideas can be extended to all sorts of other scenarios, but here I will only talk about entanglement and steering. On the top here, here in red, you have the entanglement witnessing scenario, uh, very familiar to most, I believe. You have some state, entangled state psi, shared between Alice and Bob. They take some classical inputs, x and y, and they hope to perform their target measurements a tilde and b tilde. And similarly, in the steering scenario, it's the exact same story, except that one side, in my case, Bob, is assumed to be a black box. So there the measurements are uncharacterized. There is no need to talk about errors. There is no target measurement. It can be anything. And of course, here, the consequence of our approach will be that the ideal correlations you will have, so from performing all these white box target measurements, will not be quite the same as the lab correlations you will have, since your measurements are not perfect. So we want to deal with this. So the main questions that I want to discuss here. First one, uh, what happens to standard detection schemes? So by standard, I mean normal entanglement witnesses and normal steering witnesses when measurements are actually imprecise, so they are no longer perfect. Most importantly, do you actually need to care about this when the errors are of the scales that you can consider realistic in present experiments? Second question, if we have to take this seriously, how do you rectify the standard detection methods to take tiny imprecisions into account? And thirdly, knowing that the imprecisions are there of one sort or the other, 
are there actually better ways to detect entanglement or steering than the standard methods corrected for the errors present in the devices? So this is the sort of broad strokes of what I want to start talking about. So I, I take off in the entanglement scenario and move towards steering. And the simplest case for entanglement is the bipartite entanglement scenario. Again, remember, tildes are the targets. The real devices have no tildes. So you want to get some correlations out of this. In the absolute simplest case, where you just do qubit measurements and have binary outcomes, you can, instead of working with your POVMs, you can just work with an observable instead without any loss of generality. Then the limit on the fidelity, so the imprecision parameters, they can be equivalently stated in this rather simple way. So it's simply the trace of the observables turns out to be a one-to-one -one map with the fidelity. So in the end, you can limit the trace of these observables depending on the deviation in Alice's uh, device for measurement number X. Similarly for Bob, same story, the fidelity can be limited by some quantity that is essentially the epsilon error in Bob's device for measurement number Y. So, does this have any significance at all? I will start by doing some simple case studies for witnesses that are very standard. Simplest entanglement witness I know is when you measure X and X on Alice and Bob, and then Z and Z on Alice and Bob. The normal entanglement witness can give you perfect correlations. You can have two perfect correlations in X, X, perfect in Z, Z. But if you're separable, you cannot exceed the limit of one. If you now take the errors into account, the correction looks like this. So you have the old result, one, but then you pick up this correction term to get the exact entanglement witness. Now you care about small epsilons because your errors are likely going to be small. So if epsilon is small, this kind of scales like the square root of epsilon. That's not nothing. So if your epsilon is, for example, one in a hundred, so your fidelity is 99%, the square root of that is going to be the order of 10%. Uh, so that's certainly not nothing. But maybe this is a pathological case. Maybe it's just this witness. So I go to the second simplest witness that I know of. That's when you also measure the YY correlator. Now it's known if you have entanglement, you can get perfect correlations in all three bases. So you get a value of three. If I have separable states, it's known that the value is still one. Now, this is what the expression looks like if you solve this problem. It's a bit nastier than before, but the important thing is that the contributions from the errors when they are small is again basically like square root of epsilon, a little bigger this time, but also the gap is bigger. The tiny error will still have a square root correspondence, making it quite a bit more significant. Armin, can I have a question here? Yes, so of course. Just to understand, so like this epsilon is, is the distance, I mean, it's the fidelity of the ideal uh, sigma Pauli matrix and the non-ideal one, or? Uh... Yeah, so if I target an X measurement and then we have a lab measurement, which is something else, epsilon is how close the lab is, or well, it's how far the lab is from the target. Okay, thank you. Okay, so these are two simple entanglement witnesses. I take a last case study where I take the CHSH inequality, but now use it as an entanglement witness instead. So you assume you know the measurements. It's the CHSH quantity without the whole Bell story. Okay, again, the expression becomes a bit more nasty, but the scaling is again this square root of epsilon pattern. So you don't seem to get away from the fact that tiny errors will be amplified quite a bit by this square root. Well, we can see what happens in higher dimensions as well. This was all qubit examples. I mean, can I have another question concerning the CHSH? Uh, so like if you, if you were to compare it with like self-testing statements where you have this robustness analysis, I mean... Is it like, I mean, the, the error that you get here is, uh, I mean, is it the same or it's, uh, it's, I mean, I don't think it's the same because I, again, I'm using the CHSH quantity, but there is no device independence here. Yeah, exactly. Sure. The measurements. So I, I doubt that there is a connection, but I don't really know. Well, I just wanted to, to see whether there is a comparison. So, for instance, here the error, I mean, the this case has square root of epsilon. And like for robot for self testing, it would scale as some other function of epsilon. So how fast it gets worse with the with epsilon? No? I mean the the violation of uh, CHSH. I mean the what you can say about the device based on the violation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. so it is. Haven't compared it. It's, it's, it's okay. Yes. So, but I I don't I don't really know how to answer that actually. 
I, I think the epsilons you have in self-testing are uh, are different from this ones uh, because this is an estimate of uh, it's like a ball around the target device, which mm -hmm. you assume is there. Yeah. And in self-testing, you're trying to infer it rather, no? Yeah, but then you will. I mean, you assume that you deviate slightly from the maximal violation, and then you get some estimate for the how close are the measurements. Yes. So yeah. I was thinking of like comparing these these two things, no? Because, uh, but okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the difference is that there is no target measurement in, in self-testing. Here there is the measurement that you're sort of trying to do. It doesn't even need to be the optimal one. It's just that you as an experimenter, you want something, you decide I want to do this and I want to be close to it. Yeah, exactly. So, but in self-testing, if you deviate a bit from the maximum quantum violation, you can prove that the measurement is close to the ideal one, no? Yeah. And there is some function of epsilon. Yes, but it's a relation. So in self-testing, it's a relation between the unknown measurements. But here it's a relation between no, no, one is the known. measurement and the no, target. No, in in self-testing, one is one measurement is known. Because you, you compare the unknown one with the known one, with the, the, the one that you want to self-test. Well, so, the, the self-test one is an ideal operation that you would get if your statistics was something else. But now it's not that. It's not a measurement that you're you're necessarily targeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, let's let's go on. Sorry. Okay, so, so then I want to see, so these are qubit examples, and you have this sort of square root style scaling with some variations. And I want to see what happens when you go to higher dimensions. Because you could seriously expect that the, that the scaling goes away in high dimensions. And the reason is that there are sort of two effects that are competing. On the one hand, distances in Hilbert space get longer when you have higher dimension. A simple example, if you want to go from... Uh, uh, the computational basis zero state to its Fourier transform, so it's computational, uh, it's uh, it's Fourier transform, then the distance between these two is getting longer and longer. The overlap is changing with dimension. So distance is getting longer. If you have a small error, you can get not as far, not as close to the completely different basis as you could in a low dimension. But there is also another effect, which is, of course, that High dimensional Hilbert space has many, many more directions, and there are many, many ways in which you can go wrong now as compared to before. And these two effects ought to compete with each other, and it's not, at least to me, obvious which one should win in the end. So here, we we'll try to investigate this using the, I believe, the most well-known entanglement witness, certainly in experiment, the most well-used one for high dimensional systems. It's the extension of XX plus ZZ. So Alice and Bob will both measure the computational basis, then they will both measure the Fourier transform of that basis. And then they will get their outcomes A and B, which now can have D possible values. And they want to know what's the probability of being correlated. So their outcomes should be identical. This is a, a, an old entanglement witness. Now, so I define, I want to address what is the influence of the epsilon. And I do it through this influence parameter. It's basically telling you how much of the gap between separable and entangled correlations that is eaten up by introducing the epsilon. So how much it impacts what you would have had if you would ignore the epsilons. And this is what this impact parameter looks like. If this is a numerical result. So here we have dimension on the x-axis. I'm starting from qubit going up to dimension 10 where my numerics was no longer really feasible. And here I have this impact parameter. So what you see is that if I have an error, an epsilon now, which is very, very tiny, then I first have an increase in the impact parameter, but then it seems to start going down. And you can see this more clearly as I increase the error. So what is, this is saying is that the distances are winning first. The impact, the problem is going away here, but then it's going down again, meaning the impact is getting worse. The second uh, effect here is winning out. That means that actually the impact of these small deviations is getting larger with the dimension if you go high enough. You could say, well, okay, it's not super clear here. Maybe it's happening in higher dimensions. This was what we knew back when we wrote the first paper on this, which is this one down here. Now uh, we know a bit more. This is an analytical extension of what this numerics in that paper was showing. Now we know how to prove it. So here is exactly the same story. Here I have a 0.1% error. So that's what one in a thousand. And here I have half a percent, one percent and two percent. You can see the good effect having a win in the low dimensions and then the negative effect taking over, meaning you will have a very big impact in high dimensions from very tiny errors.
I can exemplify that uh, in an experiment that we are currently pursuing in collaboration uh, with the group of Robert Fickler. So here I take a, a dimension on the x-axis and I take the Schmidt number of the entangled state of the d-dimensional state on the y-axis. So ideally, if I have, say, dimension 50, I want to certify Schmidt number 50 of a maximally entangled state. So this is what this diagonal is showing, the perfect Schmidt number section. Here, these blue and yellow lines is showing you what I can do if I have 1% error or half a percent error using only a product state. So for example, if I am in dimension 80, I can prepare a product state for you using only half a percent error in the alignment of your measurement and make it look like you have something like 50 entangled dimensions. You can fake the st entanglement statistics of very complicated states using absolutely resource-free product states, but very tiny errors in your devices. This is the case of the average fidelity. The worst case fidelity or the element-wise fidelity is a slightly, a slightly nicer, but the effect is still there. If I go to dimension 80 and I have half a percent error, I can still make it look like I have 20 entangled dimensions. So it's an example of what happens if your resolution is not high enough to really account for your errors. Okay, so the question becomes, okay, if this thing actually matters, then how can I take it into account? So we wanted to make entanglement witnesses that take imprecisions into account explicitly. So here is an example that we managed to do for two D-dimensional systems, so bipartite high dimensional. What the idea is based on uh, block observables. So these are the block observables, this lambda A, they make an orthogonal basis of the Hermitian space, basically generalizing the Paulis. And what we can say is that if you just look at the expectation values of measuring each orthogonal uh, basis observable and you add them all up, then you can give a very nice uh, compact formula for uh, how the separable limit depends on epsilon. So a couple of clarifications. This Q here is just my epsilon uh, reshaped with this expression. N is the number of measurements. So it's the number of block observables I use. Uh, in the strongest case, I would just take all of them, which is D squared, or minus one if you so wish. So then you get something rather simple. Look, for example, if I put epsilon to zero, it means that Q is equal to one. If Q is one, then this root is zero. This whole thing goes away. And I just get, well, Q is one. So I just get one from this whole second factor. And I go back to the well-known entanglement witness that has been around for 20 years or so. So then you get an exact correction for high dimensions. Here you can see how does this correction factor scale if I have a very small epsilon. So it's the expansion around epsilon zero. And you see the same business as we saw for qubits. You have a, a correction which is basically uh, given by a square root of epsilon and, and, and some coefficient in front of it, depending on the number of uh, measurements that we decide to do. All right, so we wanted to see if if situation gets even more dramatic if you go to multipartite settings. You could imagine, this was the thing we really wanted to address, we could imagine that if the errors have a big impact for bipartite systems, maybe they accumulate if you have many parties. So if I have Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and maybe many more, maybe my errors just keep blowing up with the number of parties and I just cannot, I lose all my detection power. This is interestingly not the case. It doesn't happen, at least not generically. We, we can show this by looking at the Mermin witness. So this is the Mermin, this is the Mermin operator that I think most people know from the non-locality experiments. But here you can also use it as a witness of genuine multipartite entanglement between your n different parties. This is also an old witness that this expectation value of the Mermin witness corresponds to just measuring X and Y in every single party. It's limited by this number if you are bi-separable. On the other hand, if you're GME, you can go beyond this limit. The imprecise Mermin quantity is, of course, uh, the same thing, but now we have replaced all the target observables with our epsilon incorrect observables instead. Notably, you can have different imprecise measurements for different parties. So if Alice and Bob both target X, their errors can be two different, two different observables. They don't have to be identical anymore. What we are able to prove is this theorem here, which I will read for you here. So for every biseparable state, 
and every set of local measurements with an imprecision at most epsilon, the Mermin witness is limited by this expression here. So what you see is that if I put epsilon to zero, then okay, then uh, this root goes away and this two epsilon goes away and uh, this bracket is just one. So I have two to the n minus two, which is exactly this old entanglement witness you had here. So the n dependence is expected. The correction factor, which is this parenthesis, is independent of n, meaning it's not the case that my error is accumulating over the parties. It actually doesn't matter. And this is what the rest of the theorem is saying. Moreover, the bound that we have here, you can saturate it using a biseparable state of this form. So in fact, you don't need to have something complicated. You can simply take n minus one qubits and put them in G at Z, and then you put a qubit next to it. And this way, you can saturate the limit. That what this means is that in practice, you just need to have errors on a single party, not on all of them, to saturate the limit. This is why accumulation doesn't happen for the Mermin witness. So in a sense, this is preferable for experimental purposes. Uh, we actually did this experiment in this work here. Uh, now it's on the archive. It's not preparation anymore. It's with the group of Philip Walter. We prepared a, a four qubit GZ state in polarization optics. Uh, the setup is here. I will not dwell too much on the experiment because I know you are a theory audience. But I want to point to the theoretically interesting consequences uh, of the experiment. Uh, the first thing is that, okay, before I get to that, I, I'll, I'll mention the stabilizer case. So for the Mermin inequality, the key thing, right, is that errors do not accumulate. Errors in one party are enough. This is not generically true. If I take the stabilizer witness, which is also known since quite a long time, it looks like this. This is the normal stabilizer witness. So I will measure combinations of X and Z. I will have some limit on biseparable states. I can break it with genuine multipartite entanglement. If I now try to make it imprecise, so I put epsilon here on my X axis, here I have the stabilizer witness. So if I put epsilon to zero, I'm back to the normal entanglement witness. What you see here is the corrections to this thing. Here, three is the normal uh, idealized by separable limit, the normal entanglement detection. Five is the quantum maximum. Here you see what happens when you introduce the errors. So the best by separable strategy with the errors is this green line here. You can see it's converging to the quantum one in the limit of large error. If you now have errors on only one party, like you had in Mermin, you can no longer reach the green line. It's not enough to have all your errors in a single party. It's definitely suboptimal. So now the errors, in fact, are accumulating, and they should cause some trouble if you try to expand this further on to more and more parties. OK, so with these two examples in mind, these are the fidelities that our experiment managed to measure. So we wanted to make x, y, and z measurements on our qubits, and we try to do them as good as we can. So the fidelities that we estimated, the errors in them, are of this kind here. You see that in the z basis, it's super tiny. It's three parts in 10,000. In x basis, it's slightly bigger. It's uh, six parts in 10,000. In y basis, because you have to take the lambda quarter plates phase manipulation into account, you're somewhat larger, but OK, you're well, well below 1%. OK, so what happens as a consequence of this to our fidelity analysis? Here, we have tried to decide the fidelity of our four qubit GLZ state, the one we are trying to prepare, as a, if you take the imprecisions into account. So the dashed lines here, the blue dashed line and the orange dashed line, this is the fidelity that you can infer from an idealized Mermin and stabilizer witness. It's basically fidelity estimation business as usual. The solid blue line and the solid orange line is telling you what's the fidelity you can estimate if you have this experimental data measured. So you can see that our, say, uh, roughly one in a thousand, one in 10,000 uh, scale errors actually cause several percentage points corrections to the fidelity estimation. Tiny errors have a significant impact if you allow them to conspire against your device. Okay. So this is what I wanted to say about entanglement. So I'm going to make a little wish list. Uh, I call it Armin's wish list. I would like this I don't have. That's why it's a wish list. I would like a method that can correct any entanglement witness. So I give you a normal entanglement witness in some dimension with so many systems, with so many measurements. And then I say, OK, now correct this, measure, uh, this uh, witness 
so that it can take an epsilon error on all the parties into account. This I don't know how to do, a generic method. The, all the things I've shown you are case to case. We are using different methodology to solve all those cases. In general, we don't know how to do it. But on top of that, I also want this method not only to be general, I also want it to be analytical. So I don't want some STP that in principle can solve everything, but in practice can never really be computed beyond the simplest case. So I want something analytical and easy to calculate. And on top of that, I want it, I would really like it to work for stronger entanglement concepts, like genuine multiparty entanglement, Schmidt number detection, and so on. And last, but definitely not least, these analytical, easy to calculate, fully generic bounds that work for all sorts of concepts should also be useful. They shouldn't be you know, nearly trivial. They should be fairly close to the actual result. And by now you think, geez, that's probably a really heavy wish list. That's not going to happen. And I agree. In fact, I have a method. It's unpublished because it's so bad. But I have a method that can achieve one, two, and three. But four is really terrible. The bounds are, well, they're not trivial, but they're definitely not very accurate. So I think reaching all the four points is, is a really tough one. But the interesting thing is, although... I, at least for now, we don't know how it works for entanglement. It seems to be possible for steering. And that's where, I saw, uh, right, so sorry, I wanted to show this, that uh, for some of these points, we can achieve through an STP method, others not. And the analytical attempt that I mentioned, the one that checks off one, two, and three, okay, it fails quite miserably on the four. But so this problem, we can address all these things in steering because it turns out that that scenario is a whole lot easier to deal with than entanglement detection. So I will show you the, the main results. This is from uh, this paper here on the archive of how we can do it for steering and why it's easier. So here is a generic steering type inequality. So I have a bunch of coefficients. So they depend on X and Y settings of Alice and Bob and outcomes A and B of Alice and Bob, just some real numbers. Then I have Alice's black box measurements. So these are, there is no error here. They are black box. They can be absolutely anything. But then I have Bob's target measurements, the one that in steering we assume that we know. But here we will, of course, not assume that we know the target measurements, only that we know them up to epsilon accuracy. But imagine that the normal steering inequality with the target measurements, you know that it's given by B0 or beta 0. Now I want to upgrade this so that it takes the errors into account. The, the main thing is this result. It shows you how this is done. So you can take any steering type inequality. I can maybe add that it doesn't have to be a steering one. It could also be a, a more sophisticated entanglement concept like Schmidt number. Any inequality of this type where, where A is device independent and Bob is a target, steering in particular. So you take one of these inequalities and you make sure it's valid for some class of bipartite states. In steering, that's separable for Schmidt number, for higher rank steering, and so on. Now you want to do rank one projective target measurements, so normal measurements on Bob. Now, if the lab measurements, you can associate an epsilon to each and every one of them. So when I measure measurement number Y and I get outcome number B, that projection has an error which I call epsilon BY. So that's all those fidelities that we need to estimate. Then the correction looks like this. So the bound you can put on your steering functional is, is an optimization problem that is only in a single parameter mu, which is scalar. So you have your beta zero, the actual steering inequality under idealized condition. And then you have this little correction factor here. So you see the C, Cs is just the coefficients from the inequality. And these Us here is just a shorthand for this thing. So it's a function of mu, which over which we are optimizing, and all those epsilons that you have in your lab. So you have to minimize this function, okay? It's not fully analytic, but it's a single variable optimization. It's awfully easy to do. In fact, if you are nice enough to say that, well, let's say that the errors for every measurement are the same. So all these epsilons, they are not a distribution. They are just one number. I can pick the worst one, for example. Then you can solve this analytically even, and you get an even, uh, sorry, uh, and you get an even nicer expression. Then this expression here, turns out to look like that. So you can just eliminate mu and get the exact correction. I want to say that this result too, it builds on a lemma, which I put here. This lemma is about the how you characterize the closeness of, of uh, rank one projective operators. So you basically have some target psi 
uh, you want to characterize the epsilon ball around this projector. So you want to find a way of bounding every single thing that is epsilon close to that in terms of a nice little expansion of that state. So basically what you try to do is to say the state, any state, phi, that sits in that ball, it can be bounded by taking that target, the target, the center of the ball, the thing that I'm targeting, psi, and then I can add an identity term to that. And of course, if the identity term is big enough, the whole ball is going to be contained inside. But if I do that, I get an awful bound. So you want to find the smallest identity contribution so that the whole ball is contained in this set. And that smallest contribution turns out to be this factor here, which is appearing in the theorem. So once you have derived this lemma, arriving to the theorem is rather straightforward. Now you see the reason why this works in steering, but not for entanglement. If you, you could do the exact same thing twice, you could use this lemma not only for B, but also for A. But if you do that, you end up having expressions that are very, very far from being optimal. This is just true case studies. Here, it turns out to be the opposite. How good is this result when it comes to point four? That is that the bounds are actually useful. It's clearly working for any witness and any entanglement concept, and it's analytical, but you have to show that these bounds are any good for something. That's where entanglement fails, but steering succeeds. Uh, I mean, can I have a question here? Of course. So for, for steering, you assume that the A measurements are ideal, but you, you assume that there is some deviation in B, B measurements, or? So I don't. So because Alice is a black box, there is no assumption there anyway. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, no. sure, sure. <laughs> no. Okay, so so now I want to put this thing to use in the MUB based witnesses. I went to archive and had a little count. There is at least six experiments running this witness for high dimensional systems. So I figured this would be a good candidate to see how useful the method is. So it's the same uh, correlation game as we were talking about for entanglement, but now for steering instead. You measure computational basis on Alice and Bob. You measure the Fourier transform on Alice and Bob. This is happening in dimension D. So you have D possible outcomes on each side. You want them to be correlated and you're looking for the average case, average success probability of actually correlating the two outcomes. Now, what we know is this, that the witness is limited by this thing here. This is the normal steering witness, oh, sorry, this thing here. But now once you pick up the epsilons and do the correction from our theorem, you pick up a correction that looks like this. Notice again, I put epsilon to zero, the square root goes away, this one goes away, the whole correction is gone, you're back in the normal case. So it scales both in epsilon and in the dimension. This is that uh, dimension effect that we were talking about before. So is this any good or not? In fact, ah, sorry. In fact, I can say that there exists a way of constructing a specific uh, cheating strategy. So I can find a specific strategy where I use the epsilons so that I can exactly meet this bound for any epsilon and any dimension. What that means is that this is actually tight. The upper bound can be analytically matched from below. There is no error here at all. This is the exact limit for any epsilon. So in that sense, the theorem is giving it a uh, tight result. But then you could say, okay, let's go a step further. Uh, what if the epsilon is not the same for every measurement? What if the x measurement has a different error than the z measurement? Then this happens instead. So it's epsilon 1 for x measurement, epsilon 2 for z measurement. Here, what I'm doing is that I'm taking the upper bound that I get from the theorem, and then I'm doing numerics from below trying to match it. Of course, there is no guarantee that the numerics are optimal, so I can never say that uh, whether it's exactly tight or not. But even assuming that, in the worst case, the result will get better, so that's fine. This is the difference between the analytical upper bound and the best numerical lower bound. On the diagonal, you have the case where epsilons are equal. That's the theorem where you're exactly identical. But the main point here is that even if you have very big differences between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, the difference between the lower bound and the upper bound is still pretty small. The theorem is working well, even when you have uneven, uh, uneven errors across, the, uh, across your systems. So for sure, it seems to be useful in practice. In the worst case, if you're in the red region here, when epsilon 1 is uh, 10 times worse than epsilon 2, the difference is still less than, uh, it's around 2%. And of course, you don't have that type of asymmetric errors in real life anyway. Okay, so I'm going to conclude this talk with a fun observation. 
uh, that is also in this paper. Uh, it's going to be added soon to the archives to be make it a bit more thorough. There is just an observation for now. I call it steering plateau, or in not steering, imprecision plateaus. It's a fun observation. So let us look at this yellow line here. On x-axis, I have the imprecision, that's epsilon. Here I have the visibility of the Werner state. This thing here, x, x, y, y, z, z, is a very well-known steering witness. It's known that if uh, I, it can detect the Werner state down to a visibility of one over root three. That's the number you have here when epsilon is zero. Business as usual, we know we have square root corrections of epsilon. So once you have an epsilon, it starts taking off, your detection power goes down, and it will converge to one in the limit of a very large epsilons. Here is another thing. I took another steering inequality, but now if this steering inequality is not optimal. It's actually a Bell inequality where I now stop assuming, where I assume that I know the measurements of one side. So I'm basically turning a Bell inequality into a steering inequality. It's a platonic one in the sense that the measurements you're targeting are a tetrahedron on Alice's side and an octahedron on Bob's side. What happens now is very funny. So here, if you have no epsilon, you can show again, just like the x, x, y, y, z, z case, one over square root of three is the detection limit for the Werner state uh, in the steering case. We also know that there is no better inequality if you have three settings. This is known from other works. What happens now is that if you introduce the epsilon, you don't take off with the square root correction. Instead, you have this little plateau here. So it goes flat until you hit some number, and then it starts taking off. That's why I call it an imprecision plateau. Originally, uh, as is written in the paper, it's basically a funny numerical observation. I spent a week trying to break it because I assumed this was some numerical error. Well, in fact, I could never break it. I just got the same result over and over again. Uh, now, which is the thing that will be added here with some more detail, is that we can actually prove this limit exactly that this plateau has to happen. It's not an accident. It's a, it's a necessary thing. But what's, what's interesting about it is that this means that you can have steering experiments with unideal devices, with realistically sized errors, for which you pay no price at all in the correction of your local hidden state bound. The size of this plateau is larger than these measurements that we made in our experiment. These things are all, even the Y case, significantly smaller than the size of our plateau. It means with that type of scaling, you could do steering experiments under more, um, more um, uh, less idealized assumptions without paying any loss in your detection power. OK, so all in all, uh, wrapping it up, the main conclusions of all this is that small deviations in entanglement and steering experiments have large impacts, at least on every case study we have seen so far, with the exception of this plateau. Methods to take imprecisions into account in realistic experiments. So this is basically what I've been talking about, how we can correct for errors or epsilon corrections to witnesses of steering and entanglement. The thing that, of course, I really like to have and definitely do not have is a general method for entanglement scenarios, basically the counterpart to what I showed you for steering, but for entanglement that works for all scenarios and give pretty good bounds, if not tight ones. Finally, I would like to emphasize that once you, once you want to start talking about uh, inexact devices, imprecise devices, the way you model the imprecision, there is a lot of options for that. We decided to go with fidelity-based measures because they are operationally estimatable. That is, you can actually measure them in the lab. They have a clear meaning, and they are generically nice to work with. But of course, you can come up with another way, maybe from another perspective, interesting way to deal with these imprecisions. And of course, the point is that this is not a unique way by any means. You have whether other approaches would change something radically is something that I do not know, but would be very interested in. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming here, coming here to, 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 to this very nice seminar. Now we have time for questions. Uh, maybe I can start. Uh, hi, Armin. Uh, OK, I have to put two questions. First is uh, about the witnesses for like the uh, just the general, not, not not the steering one, but the previous. Uh, I don't know how do you call the scenario. Uh, yeah, this one's? Yeah, yeah. So if you introduced like the epsilon kind of distance or error, whatever you call it, 
uh, can you still create this kind of is this like notion of optimality of a witness still hold in a sense that like there is no witness that contains this witness do you did you look into that so we did not look at it but it will not hold so okay. the optimality of so uh, an entanglement witness is basically a hermitian operator mm -hmm. so you can define the notion of optimality or tightness depending on which one you prefer uh, based on those hermitian matrices alone but as soon as you introduce the epsilons, you cannot characterize it in terms of Hermitian matrices anymore, because now your measurements are, well, they're not fixed anymore. Okay, okay. So you have to define it on the level of correlations. And okay, what that definition would be, we have not worked on that, but it would certainly have to be different. Okay, yeah, yeah. makes sense, it makes sense. Okay, and the second one is to the plateau. Uh, if you have like the analytical proof, do you have any like, kind of easy intuition why it happens because that's very surprising to me that it's... yes so actually i asked a lot of people who are much more familiar with steering than i am about this and uh, many times uh, well surprise was the typical reaction which i found very interesting so first i can tell you that we first proved this plateau through an stp relaxation method that we devised for this so that showed that this plateau has to exist and that the cutoff is exactly at this rather arbitrary number that we were finding. But of course, these STP methods, they rarely tell you why it's happening. They just prove to you that it's there. So now, recently, I was talking with Otfrid in Siegen, and we came up with this very nice argument for this specific example. So this is one specific example where you can see why it's happening. So the reason is that if you evaluate all the deterministic strategies of Alice, so the black box in my example, you will okay, you get a set of different strategies, and all of them depend on epsilon, yes. of course, like the epsilon sub dot. But the brilliant thing with this specific witness here is that the specific strategy that gives you the steering or LHS limit, so the one corresponding to the point here, mm -hmm. this one is independent of epsilon. So as I increase epsilon, that strategy will just be constant. The second best strategy does depend on epsilon, oh, okay. far below that limit. So it has it's come. So you have this flat thing, yeah, and, yeah, up, yeah, and yeah. it's coming up and up and up. And at some point, it crosses and it becomes the new LHS bound. Oh, okay. This is why the plateau can happen. So in a sense, I think you you asked about optimality. This is the thing that I, I'm very excited about now. How can you systematically construct steering inequalities that have this very appealing property? And how big can you make these plateaus? Because now you basically want a free lunch. You want to have lots oh, of, yeah, of course. and not pay for them. That's the idea. OK, thank you. Very nice. Uh, OK, now uh, we have more questions. So perhaps I'll ask uh, about uh, the assumption that the measurements are rank one projective. So is it essential to, to assume this? So no, it's not essential, but for what I did here, it's necessary. So the reason we were doing rank one was basically because in experiments, they are typically looking at that. And it makes it a bit easier to define. So, if, for example, if we would go away from rank one projective measurements and just say it's an arbitrary POVM instead, then, okay, our fidelity, we can still work with it, but it would be quite a bit more nasty than this. Right? So, and this is what we wanted to avoid. But then again, it's, I know very few cases where somebody's actually targeting a noisy measurement. So we restricted to this. You could certainly define a distance, another distance measure, or even the fidelity that has all these properties. It will just be harder to work with. Our fit terms will not work for sure if you change this. But, but then in the experiments, how do they uh, how do they certify that a measurement is rank one projective, even if it's not the one that they want to measure? Well, they well depends. So sometimes they can do tomography. That's a popular one if it's small enough. In our case, we would simply say, well, you want to do rank one, but you acknowledge that in real life you're doing a non-projective measurement, which is something. Exactly. Uh -huh. Just estimate the fidelity and deduce everything from that. That's our recipe. Okay. But it might be that, uh, so here we have to assume that the, uh, the dimension is fixed. No? So it might be that the measurement somehow mostly sits in, I don't know, in a cubic Hilbert space, but there is some epsilon addition that lives somewhere else. 
And you, you uh, don't have access to that, no? But this is a very good point. So here we are assuming fixed degrees of freedom. So dimension is known. Mm -hmm. Error is happening in a fixed space. So indeed, you can go away from that, but that's fine. But we didn't do it. Uh, a fun point to make uh, on that regard is that if you look into, ah, sorry, I do. If you look into the proof of this plateau that we had here in the end, uh, hold on, let's see. The proof of this plateau, okay, this is again assuming qubits, like you were saying, mm -hmm. but you can in fact prove that the plateau exists, it's just a bit smaller, even if you don't assume qubits. So in this way, you can get some of the qualitative results won't go away. Uh, it, it will just shrink quantitatively. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I would have a question. Uh, so, I mean, can you uh, think a way of uh, uh, calculating or at least coming up with a number that would give you the signaling that come out from these imprecision measurements? This imprecision parameter. What do you mean by signaling here? Uh, how do I say? Well, uh, when you have imprecision uh, during measurements, you can come up with uh, this 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 amount of uh, information that could come from one measurement to the other side, even if you don't have this 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 information going. But it it's artificial. It's something that come up with uh, errors. Yeah, so this goes back a bit to our model, this one here. So uh -huh. if you look at the green box, we are still assuming that you have a bipartite Hilbert space. So your, mm -hmm. your error here, that tilde free one, this is still in Bob's lab. So no signaling is always respected by construction in our model. Your errors are local, they are not global. Mm -hmm. If we would have global errors, okay, then the signaling would happen. But in our model, we Bob is Bob and Alice is Alice. There is no interaction between them. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you 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 cannot simulate this this signal. You are you are starting from the point that you you cannot have signaling. Yes, yeah, no signaling okay. is built into our our framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, perhaps I would have another question. So, like, have you thought of like doing the same with the state? So, I mean, here you say that the measurements are imprecise, but maybe the state is also not so well prepared. So that would be psi here. Yeah. Yes. So no, we here we did not do that because I guess typically, if you want to detect the entanglement, then it's already an unknown variable. So there is no imprecision. You would have to have a scenario where you typically assume you know the state, but maybe not the measurement rather. So, so in entanglement cases, we haven't done that. But in prepare and measure scenarios, we did something in that direction some time ago. We called it uh, distrust-based uh, semi-device independence. So you're preparing states, but those states are not exact. That's the mm -hmm. distrust. You can tune that. But of course, there is no entanglement in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So yes, the answer to your question is no. We, we didn't do it in the time. Okay, thank you. More questions? No, I think uh, we don't have more questions. So maybe we can uh, finish the session. Thank you very much, Ari, for accepting our invitation. It was a pleasure. And see you next time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.